Hello, welcome. My name is Mark Jensen for BSW. Today I wanted to take a look at the Vorsys M1, I should say, ultra high resolution voice processor. Now, what I found with the Vorsys M1 that uh, was most interesting is that it can sound extremely transparent. It can also sound a little bit gritty. It can give you some of that warmth using zeros and ones. It creates something that is uh, is very different and uh, certainly can be uh, very pleasing to the ears. Probably the most important thing, and one of the things that stood out to me, is this incredibly clean, nice-sounding mic preamp. I'm running the levels extremely low and then in post bumping them up a little bit for you. But uh, just the, the noise floor itself is very impressive. So without talking further, uh, at least uh, into the camera, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the very unique features of the M1. We can only scratch the surface, but I think in doing so, we'll give you a good idea of what it can do. The real core of the Vorsys M1 is in the remote control of that product. Now, the M1, of course, is a um, mostly DSP product. Uh, I'm currently utilizing just the preamp of the M1 right now, and we are utilizing a dynamic microphone. This is an ElectroVoice RE20, and uh, that's really all we're utilizing. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll start up the Vorsys M1 program or software. And just move this up a little bit. And you can see right now that we're currently offline, so none of the features are lit up yet. We'll go ahead and take a look. I do want to let you know, I'm going to go over the highlights of this, uh, this device and the software, but there is so much to the M1 and so many things that can be altered, changed, and so many different personalities that can come out, out of this product that it's really difficult to um, put it all in a video So uh, without being uh, very, very long. So what I'll do is try to hit on the highlights, the things that really set it apart, and uh, let's jump into that right now. You'll notice the status is offline. We need to make that online. So now it comes to life. We're currently using the device called Studio. This software can control multiple M1 devices. We're also utilizing a preset that I've already set up. Uh, levels OK, test 2. And uh, so we also have, if we look at the software, a um, distinct set of uh, or areas that uh, control the M1. Now, of course, you can utilize the... The knobs, I don't really want to call them potentiometers uh, because they, uh, they are not. But anyway, the knobs on the front panel, it is front panel controllable, of course, fully. Uh, but the software just tells you so much more. Okay, we have the in the top part of the screen, besides the status, devices, and presets, we have distinct sections of the M1. And in here, this will actually be the controls for those discrete sections. Now, down here we have a very simple metering input level. We have uh, also the expander level, otherwise known as a gate, the deesser function, the compressor, and the output. You're currently seeing down here the graphical representation of my voice as we utilize this. In a um, FFT format, we can also utilize this as an oscilloscope. And I'm not driving it hard, but you can see the uh, the scope. Um, if I bump up the gain, which you're, I don't want to too much, okay. But you can you can get an idea. I'm going to bump this down to a realistic level, and uh, as well, it's uh, worthy to note that a dynamic microphone on many other vocal strips would be probably maxed out. This is a 70 dB preamp, ultra quiet, works quite well. Okay, I'm gonna turn the oscope function off. I find that this really, the FFT display, gives me a lot of information, really tells me what my voice is doing, where it's doing it in the, um, the pass band, 
And uh, let's jump right in. Okay, we have input-output, very self-explanatory. We also have, now it's important to turn on the section as well, the uh, high-pass filter, and uh, that's at uh, currently uh, 20 hertz. And the good thing is, or the really cool thing is, we can actually take and shape this and set the, uh, the high-pass filter to whatever we'd like. Uh, we can do the same with the low pass filter and just drag that and there's the kind of a telephone quality and uh, we can also utilize the front panel or the uh, GUI controls here and you'll find uh, there are, are different ways of accomplishing the same thing with the M1 a very uh, very convenient way of controlling this Okay, as well, we have the input and the output stages to let you know via the scope or the FFT display uh, what we're uh, doing or how we've modified the uh, scope of the, uh, of the input and output. Here you can see uh, we have switched on the input-output section. You do have a decorrelator. The decorrelator, kind of like a, a phase rotator, it um, basically will give you more symmetry so that the processor and the filter sections work um, more efficiently. If we move on to the, and you'll note as well, we've turned the section on, it um, correlates to this. The expander does exactly what we expected to do. It, uh, if we turn it on, you'll notice there is the gate in the expander section. And we can set the depth. We can set the threshold as well as the closure time of that gate. It's all reflected graphically both here and uh, you can monitor it right here. So if we move on to the uh, deesser section, this is the one I had the most uh, issues or problems with. The uh, exact slope and move it around. Now the deesser, at least for my voice, is hitting right around 6.8, 6.9. Sorry for that. But you could see that rise if you look right there. And you can also drag this around at will to invoke that deesser. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and deessers in general, uh, I've always had a hard time with. So. Take that for uh, what you will, but uh, that is probably the least useful function, at least for me. The parametric EQ, talk about night and day. Okay, this is where you can just endlessly create personalities for the M1. So you have a low shelf filter, high shelf filter, in between, you have two parametric EQs. This gives you so much power. The switch or the uh, check mark here for EQ pre-comp is um, pretty self-explanatory, but basically you're uh, utilizing the filters either pre or post compressor, and that really just uh, comes out to your preference. The uh, low shelf filter, high shelf filter, no real secrets there. You can see that as I move the slider that this correlates to the graph and uh, likewise. Again, multiple ways of accomplishing the same thing. As I bring up the low end, it gets a little bit boomy. As we cut this down a bit, uh, it uh, does the opposite. Uh, all of this is calibrated in uh, in DB, so you can see what's happening. A very cool feature. Now, I'll go ahead and grab the, um, there's the high shelf. Again, pretty much what we expect. And the very interesting part with the uh, parametric EQs is that you can actually see what you're doing. So you grab the crosshairs, and you can manipulate those at will, and move them around, and you'll notice, of course, drastically, this is going to change the shape of my sound. You'll notice this pyramid when you select the crosshair. The pyramid really shapes the, the curve 
or the Q of that frequency that you select to emphasize, de-emphasize, or, um, or keep neutral. I'm going to put a little articulation bump right at about oh, 7 kilohertz or so for my voice. And I can make that a little bit sharper and even pull it up. This, well, this is kind of getting in the way. This is the wet blanket effect. We don't want that there, really. Again, here, an upside-down uh, pyramid, but this will shape the cue of that particular frequency. Again, we have multiple ways of uh, accomplishing certain things. We can grab the slider or we can grab the graph directly. So um, let me go ahead and give this just a little bit more bite. I'm going to move this right up here, and I'm going to bring this up a bit more, and we'll go ahead and widen the cue just a little bit. This gives you some idea of exactly what you can do. Bring up the high shelf on the high end, which is, um, is just going to give it a little bit more bite, it's kind of um, the sound that I like. So that's the parametric EQ section. The compressor, one of my favorites, of course. And uh, we'll go ahead and turn that section on, and uh, you'll start seeing a little bit of uh, compressor action here in the meters. Uh, this is all really basic fare here. The threshold the uh, compressor uh, invokes at, at the ratio, uh, 1 dB, how aggressive... Uh, to that relationship it's going to act, the attack time, and the release. A lot of latitude there to really shape this graphically uh, however you like and uh, audibly. So uh, that really covers, now here uh, another thing is the input and output. The, uh, there is the post-processing uh, FFT graph. You can see it's gotten a little bit fatter, a little bit wider, kind of what you'd expect. The uh, input, a little bit more mellow. And um, again, this is what you would expect. So we have the input, the output in between, the compressor, the de and the noise gate. I'm actually going to take the expander and set the release time a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so 410 milliseconds. You can notice, you can actually see the expander drop down here. If we set this very aggressively, instantaneously, and if we set it uh, at about one second, well, it's going to need recover time. So split the difference here. And what we'll do next is really take a look at a very powerful set of features on the M1. And that uh, really resides in the preset area, the library devices, the skins, and also the buffering section, which offer things that um, really I have n never seen in a device of this class. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. After you've spent all that time configuring your Vorsis M1, wouldn't it be nice to know that you could actually recall your settings, save them, keep them, make sure that they are safe, and most of all, have multiple configurations. So this is obviously very important if you're in a production and studio environment. It's also important to be able to keep and uh, restore this information if you're utilizing this on air at your station. And uh, just for a whole host of reasons, this is really good stuff that we'll take a look at. So first of all, we'll go ahead and put the uh, M1 online. It comes to life. And take a look at the preset uh, library and devices menu It's uh, or buttons. It's probably important to note that these three buttons control the hardware, the device. These two are file systems. You can really, uh, file system uh, manipulation, you can really think of the top three in that category. The bottom three are very temporal. These are real, really all tied to the internal buffer in the software. Once you leave the software, these are gone. 
These are basically around to help you manipulate while you're working within the software and then make choices that affect the final product. So let's jump in and take a look. The buttons really kind of help us categorize things, but it's just as easy anywhere on the window here to right click and access the menus, those same menus. The first thing is, and about of course just tells us the version of the software, center window, uh, these are really not that critical. Choose skin, that's critical. If we do that, you'll notice the, uh, at least as I record this, the M1 is sh shipped with four of these skins. Now the skins themselves, well, they're not all that critical in that respect and that they really just change the color. But if we go and take a look at the skins that I've downloaded from Wheatstone called Talent Control Skins, these are extremely important. So if you take a look at this, it really changes the entire interface. It does allow you to do all of the uh, critical things like uh, notice your levels, even take a look at your uh, waveform, but it doesn't allow you to control or reconfigure your M1. This is important, of course, if you basically want to lock down the device. You don't want your on-air talent or somebody to change all of those controls or even have access to them. Now, you may be thinking, well, you can always just do this. This is probably not the way you would normally set it up where you have access to both talent and control skins. And this is where I mentioned um, in the review that it, the file system is, is a little bit, uh, it's basic. It gets the job done, but uh, it's just, uh, you really have to know what's going on. So the idea would be that you would take these four skins or your control skins however many there may be, and move them to a safe place if you want to lock down your M1. So normally, the uh, talent or the people utilizing the equipment that you don't want to make changes, they would only see the talent control skins. Sure, they could change the color, but beyond that, they can't really change anything else. So if we go back here, and bring up the control skin. Again, we have full control now over the software. So that's just something you have to kind of plan, and it's really up to you and the file system how you want to sort those out. The uh, presets. If we look at the uh, take preset window, uh, this is uh, a kind of j just a simple way of, uh, of doing that. And uh, we have multiple presets here that I have saved last one being bad sounding. Uh, the current one that we're utilizing here in the presets window tells us uh, level OK, test 2. So I know that I'm currently utilizing this. But if I wanted to take the bad sounding preset, there it is. I've kind of chopped the uh, bandwidth a little bit in doing that. Uh, also, the narrow Q. And this one sounds a little bit hollow. All different settings, of course. I'll bring this back here. It's as simple as that. In the now, that's for the um, the skin and for the preset. Uh, I access those in in different ways. So uh, let's go down to presets, and you, we were just looking at the take library, but let's look at this. This is the preset library. So here, this is a little bit. Um, it's kind of like take, but um, it has extra functions. So we do see the same favorites here that have been saved. But as well now, you can, when configuring this, save new configurations. Uh, you can also just do a take. This pretty self-explanatory and copying, pasting, renaming. This is a very critical one in that uh, you can actually view your settings. So you can look at all of the values for these settings. 
it's, I think, very, very uh, cool to do. And uh, you can even print these out. And so that, uh, again, a very powerful feature. The um, Now, this really kind of surprised me because what you can do is a, a difference. Now, currently, you can see the difference between the preset and what you have here. So everything in red has been changed. I'm going to go back to the last preset here. This is test OK. And we'll view the difference between what we have currently and the change that I've made. And I was testing you there. Now, you have to get rid of the window first. And then, OK, I'll make the change. And then we'll bring this back to the library and view differences. So those are the differences. Again, I think extremely powerful. And the ability to print these out in hard copy if anything should happen to the files. So that is um, that really covers the both the skins and the hardware. Devices, you can uh, easily assign multiple M1s to a single piece of software. And how we do that, currently the uh, device is called Studio. I've got that highlighted, edited, the um, friendly sounding name right here, and the uh, octets here show us the uh, current IP address. This is a non-routable uh, IP. You can also use routable IP addresses if you want to address this from a WAN. The um, Studio 1A, if I look at that, completely different subnet and uh, IP address and uh, so on. So it's very um, versatile is the best word I can come up with. It just allows you to do so much. So that basically covers these three buttons. And let's take a look and see if there's... Is anything obvious that I've missed? Online mode, of course, can be uh, that can be selected right here as well. Login password that just uh, is the login password to the physical device itself. A uh, version tells you the version of the software. You can update the software as well. Assign IP address that allows you to configure the device when it's brand new. The uh, presets menu. We took a look at the take menu, the library menu. The take menu, just for simply taking a new preset, the library menu gives more flexibility in being able to save the changes that you made. These are kind of cool. These, again, are the uh, buffer buttons. And uh, so everything, again, once you shut down the software, the buffer clears. So they're really made to be used while you're within the M1 software. This is quick save A, quick save B, and B equals A. So currently, the buffer with all of those parameters that we looked at is saved in A. If I click on B, it will actually be different if I change. I'm going to open this up. And now we go back here to quick save A. Quick save B. This works great, of course, as a um, way of comparing your changes very quickly, right on the fly. And so, of course, I like that a little bit better. A equals B. Now they're the same. So we've taken the value from B and put it to A. That really covers, I think, the most powerful features of the M1 software when it comes to configuration. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, glimpse at the M1, the uh, ultra-high resolution mic processor. I think it earns its name. It almost takes a little bit of getting used to because you have so much latitude in that uh, DSP engine. Range and the ability to be a chameleon. That's what the M1 is. For BSW, my name is Mark Jensen. Have a great day.